It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Steve Forbes is chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes Media. Under his leadership, Forbes Media has launched a number of publications, including Forbes Life, Forbes Europe, and Forbes Asia. He earned his BA in history from Princeton University. In 1985, Mr. Forbes was appointed chairman of the Board of International Broadcasting by President Ronald Reagan. In his position, Mr. Forbes oversaw the operations of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. In both 1996 and 2000, Mr. Forbes campaigned for the Republican nomination for the presidency. He is the author or co-author of numerous books, including Freedom Manifesto, Why Free Markets Are Moral and Big Government Isn't, Flat Tax Revolution, Using a Postcard to Abolish the IRS, How Capitalism Will Save Us, Why Free People and Free Markets Are the Best Answer for Today's Economy, and most recently, Money, How the Destruction of the Dollar Threatens the Global Economy and What We Can Do About It. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Steve Forbes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for those very kind words. And uh, thank all of you uh, for coming here, being here on a Sunday night. Uh, it's always dangerous to speak to a group after a dinner on, on a Sunday night. Very dangerous. So I hope the uh, cold air and some caffeine at dinner uh, have perked you up. And it is great fun to be here at Hillsdale, uh, seeing the H here reminds one that H can stand for good things, not just Harvard. So, uh... <laughs> but it is a pleasure to see Larry Arn and others who have uh, nurtured and grown this great institution thanks to your support. And one of the things that Hillsdale preaches and practices is intellectual diversity. Uh, others are like uh, often, you know, oftentimes I can say it because our kids are out of their teen years, but uh, teenagers often think they're very rebellious, but they all do the same thing among their, their peers. And in terms of uh, universities and too many academic institutions these days, they preach diversity, but you're allowed to have diversity, sort of like Henry Ford when he learned that General Motors was going to allow you to choose the color of your own car, uh, Henry Ford famously said, you can have any color you want among Ford products, which was one, as long as it is black. And, and, and so uh, in terms of diversity, it means just one thing. You march in line, and if you're out of line, obviously you are dishonest. You're guilty of micro, I love that word, microaggression and every, every other sin in the book. And they're now even going after Exxon, the Attorney General in New York, because they opposed the idea of climate change, global warming. Uh, therefore, this uh, may come under RICO, a racketeering thing. They weren't telling the truth. Therefore, they must, they must be uh, punished. So George Orwell, Orwell was right. You can twist language in any which way and say you're for the First Amendment, but if you uh, commit a crime and not tell the truth about uh, climate change, by golly, we can come after you. Uh, Stalin would have loved it. But it is, it is a great honor to be here, and I've been asked tonight to uh, talk about money, monetary policy, and I do so with trepidation. And I'm uh, glad you are a polite audience, because it's not the most exciting subject in the world. When you say monetary policy, Federal Reserve, exchange rates, quantitative easing, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, I mean, the eyes get heavy, even though you know it's important. And so this subject has not got the excitement of Fifty Shades of Grey. It is, it is, it is not like watching Naked in the Jungle. But so let me just uh, give you a reward in advance for what I'm about to do to you, and that is if you ever find yourself in an airplane, in coach, middle seat, 
on the runway, watching your life pass away, and you want a little bit of elbow room with your seatmates, start talking to them about monetary policy. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll cut you a wide berth. So, while, while, uh, but while it is not inherently sexy, uh, monetary policy, money, is absolutely crucial. You can get things right on government spending, you can get it right on regulation, you can get it right on taxes, but if you don't get the money right, you're going to have a troubled subpar economy. And we see the proof of it around the world today, in the monetary chaos around the world. A critical reason why uh, the world's in the trouble that's, that it is in, and as I'll discuss, critical reason why the U.S. is in the trouble that it is in. And the reason money is so crucial is simple. How do we progress? How do we get ahead? How do we achieve a higher standard of living? We do it by trading with each other, buying and selling with each other, interacting with each other. And money simply makes it easier to do those things. You know, otherwise, we'd still be living in caves, subsistence level if we couldn't engage in trade. Now, to show why there's more of me today than there was 10 years ago or five years ago, I'll give the example of, say, baking a cake. Think of all the little transactions you do baking a cake. You gotta get the egg, the milk, the flour, butter, spoons, measuring spoons, ovens, electricity, the whole thing. So without trading, we wouldn't get anywhere. You know, in the old days, before we had money, money makes trading much easier. Before we had money, we had barter, which was very inefficient. You know, we, uh, what economists call coincidence of wants. So if you didn't have the coincidence of wants, uh, you couldn't make the transaction. You know, let's, let's say 3,000 years ago, I sold an ad in Forbes. How would I get paid? Uh, perhaps with a herd of goats. Uh, being a little facetious here, but let's say I wanted to uh, buy iPads for our writers. So I go to the Apple store with a herd of goats. The Apple store owner says he doesn't want goats, he wants sheep. So I have to figure out how to swap the goats for sheep. Perhaps have to hire a sheep herder to make sure the wolves don't eat the sheep. Now the sheep herder wants to be paid with wine. I've got red wine, he wants white wine. Just, 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 just becomes very inefficient. You know, just imagine if we had barter today. Imagine trying to deposit a pig into an ATM or withdrawing a cow or a chicken. Just, 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 just doesn't work very well. So money, money was invented in the marketplace, not by government, although government soon got involved as it does with anything to do with wealth or wealth creation, but it was invented in the marketplace. People trying to figure out ways to make it easier to uh, do business with one another, buy and sell with one another. And the transactions are critical. I mean, Adam Smith, you all know what Adam Smith told us about transactions. Each gets something from the trade. Each gets something from the trade. Contrary to what a lot of the left believes, uh, transactions are uh, the way we get ahead. It's not greed. We each get something for it. Uh, some things are more fun to buy than others. Buying a handbag is fun. Buying a sports car is fun. Much more fun than paying the electricity bill or uh, paying the rent if you uh, rent a place. Although it's amazing the people who complain about electricity bills and the like don't hesitate to go out and spend two or three hundred dollars on a pair of blue jeans that look like they came from a dumpster. Go figure, that's, that's human nature. But money, money makes transactions infinitely easier. You determine what you get in the transaction. I say you, uh, you pay me money for a subscription. I determine what I get in return for that trade. Money, money is, has no intrinsic value. That's what economists, too, too many in the Federal Reserve and elsewhere, don't understand. Money in and of itself has no intrinsic value. It's often just a few ellipses on a computer, pieces of paper. It's not wealth. Money measures wealth. Money measures value. Money measures value the way scales measure weight, rulers measure length, clocks measure time. Money's like a claim check. You know, you go to a restaurant, you deposit your coat, you get a claim check. Money is simply a claim on products and services. And it's based on trust. But unfortunately, our authorities believe today, you might call it the coat check theory of economics. You know, if you understand that money is a claim on products and services, 
you'll see how silly it is to think if you uh, uh, do more money, you somehow create more products and services. No, money represents products and services. So uh, let's say a restaurant. Let's say, let's say Ben Bernanke was running a restaurant. And he figures out that if he creates more coat checks, that'll stimulate the creation of more coats, which will mean more customers in the restaurant. That's about the level of thinking in the Federal Reserve today. And so, yeah, coat check theory of economics. It's a, uh, or you know, uh, not not to belabor the thing, but you know, after World War II in the Pacific, some uh, island uh, islanders, uh, you, may, you may have read about the cargo cult, and uh, the, the the locals during the war saw when we built these runways that people would wave sticks in the air and out would come a plane out of the sky and disgorge all this stuff. And they figured out after the war, if they built a tower and went up to the tower and waved sticks, that somehow these great birds from the sky would come and disgorge stuff. That, and it, that also represents the Federal Reserve. Wave the sticks and the stuff will come. But you know, as you know, as you know, critical to markets, critical to functioning market, is fixed weights and measures. You buy a pound of cheese, you assume it's 16 ounces. It doesn't vary in weight each day, the uh, dealer is honest. It doesn't float from 13 ounces one day to 18 the next. Uh, you ruler, 12 inches and a foot, that doesn't float, that doesn't change each day. You buy a gallon of gasoline. You assume it's the same volume of liquid today as it was yesterday and it'll be the same thing tomorrow. And so if you understand that, then you can understand that money works best when it has a fixed value. Now just to, to, to hammer home the point, imagine what your life would be like if the Federal Reserve was put in charge of clocks and watches, and they decide to float the hour, decide to float clocks. So you have 60 minutes an hour one day, 42 minutes an hour the next, 88 minutes the day after, It'd be chaotic, It'd be chaotic. Now imagine baking a cake, that cake I talked about. It says bake the batter for 35 minutes. You'd have to figure out, is that nominal minutes? Inflation adjusted minutes? Is it, is it a Michigan minute, a Mexican minute? You'd have you know, futures in minutes. So the, the, the perils, the perils of unstable money when it doesn't have that fixed value are multitudinous. First of all, you all know, Prices disseminate critical information. Prices tell us uh, what, uh, what, what something is valued at, uh, whether it's uh, in short supply or in surplus. Prices give us information. But when you have unstable money, that's like a virus in the computer. It corrupts the information. One example, go back to the 1970s. None of you remember the 1970s. Yeah, that's called pandering. I tried it and politics didn't work, which is why I'm here tonight cadging free meals off of Larry Arn. But, uh, but back, back, back in the 1970s, uh, we went off the rails on money. And we had a huge inflation. Oil went from around $3 a barrel to almost $40 a barrel. The price was going up. Copper went up. Commodities went up. And everyone figured, well, if the price is going up, it must mean we're running out of the stuff. There's not enough of it out there. But it turns out that high price, seemingly, was not so much scarcity as it was the weak dollar. So in the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan and Paul Volcker, the then head of the Fed, kill the terrible inflation. What happens to oil? It comes crashing down from almost $40 a barrel to $10 a barrel, finally stabilizes at 20 to 25. Texas went through a virtual depression in the mid-1980s. You saw the same thing in agriculture. Commodity prices were going up, land prices were seemingly going up. So hey, plant from fence post to fence post, borrow, lever, because by golly, this thing, this thing was going on and on. So you had a depression in, the, in agriculture. Iowa was hit hard. Housing also had a bit of a bubble, but because Fannie and Freddie weren't as big then, we didn't have the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, that, that, that disaster would come later. But in the early 2000s, we went off the rails again. And by the way, talking about oil, those of you in the business well know, from the mid 80s to the early part of the last decade, the average price of oil was a little over $21 a barrel. Then 
we went off the rails again. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department decided to weaken the dollar, help pull us out of, they thought, the 2000-2001 recession, but they kept on because they thought that would help exports, you know, cheat on the prices. That'll help uh, give you some uh, quick prosperity. And so, look what happened. Oil went up from the 20s, $100 a barrel. A couple of years ago, the Fed started inadvertently tightening again. I'll discuss that in a minute. They didn't know what they were doing, nothing new. Dollar strengthens, commodities crash. Another period of chaos. So what happens when you have unstable money? Not only do prices not give you reliable information anymore, you get less investment. You know better than anyone, investing is risky. But if you don't know what you're going to, especially you invest in something that's unknown or that is not yet seen, building a new factory, new product, creating a new service, Maybe a year, five years, and you're in the drug business, 10 years before you uh, get, get the return on the investment. And so if you don't know what you're, that's risky enough. If you don't know what you're gonna get paid back in, is it gonna be a 10 cent on the dollar? 50 cents on the dollar? Dollar 10 on the dollar? You don't know. And so it's no surprise with this instability of the dollar that what you might call productive investment, productive risk taking has gone into the tank. And one of the things that happens, as I mentioned, Money goes into hard assets, the things that already exist. So right now, the dollar is strong temporarily. So we're on a roller coaster. It's like a watch, a watch that's either too slow or too fast. Neither one does you any good. And that's the kind of situation we have now. We don't have an accurate timepiece when the watch is going all over the place. You have also the same thing with money. So today's currencies, absolutely unstable. Dollars like a yo-yo. And so we have the spectacle today, currency trading. When the dollar was fixed in value, you didn't need much currency trading. Today, the amount of volume of currency trading, nominal value is over $5 trillion a day, more than stocks and bonds. And so we had a period of a weak dollar from 2001 to 2013. Now we have a temporarily strong dollar. Weak dollar is why we got the commodities boom. Strong dollar is why now we're getting the opposite. So these things, they get these false bubbles. I mean, look what happened to housing. Goose by Fannie and Freddie and Community Reinvestment Act and quotas on subprime mortgages and the like. But we never would have had that bubble, on, certainly not on the scale we did if the dollar hadn't been weakened and money was seeking hard assets. But you know, again, talking about corrupting the price. Prices of houses go up, people figure, well, there are not enough of them. Price keeps going up. They invented a new mortgage. The new mortgage was, why have an income? You know, it just keep, keep, keeps going up. You know, what, what, what's the point? And so then you get the inevitable, you get the inevitable day after, the morning after. And so you get less real lending, productive lending in the credit markets. You, today, this is compounded by severe regulations on banks. You're in the banking business. You know, regulators sometimes go over almost every loan you make. And so then they wonder why, with that kind of hyper-regulation, why we don't get the kind of lending to small and new businesses that are the job creators. So in terms of, in terms of what's taking place today, in terms of what's taking place today, the Federal Reserve, you remember uh, Laurel and Hardy, when uh, Hardy would turn to Laurel and say, You've, this is a fine mess you've made. Federal Reserve is doing the same thing. You know, after, after, after the 2008-2009 debacle, we're just trying to come off of it now, what do they do? They, have, they buy up all long-term bonds. They're trying to suppress interest rates across the board. So there has now a bloated portfolio. But you know what they did with that? By suppressing prices? The distortion was one critical reason why we have this uh, semi-recession today. They suppress prices. You know price controls don't work. Take rent controls. It's great if you have an apartment that already exists, if you don't mind lack of maintenance. But you know, $10 rent on Park Avenue, that sounds pretty good. But no one's going to build an apartment, a new one, when you have below market or don't know what you're going to get in terms of being able to charge for a price. Same thing as in ter terms of lending. They suppress interest rates across the board, not just short-term rates, but long-term rates. First time outside of a major war, they tried that trick. And so what happens is 
If you don't know what you're going to get on a loan, especially when regulators are looking over your shoulder, less lending, lending takes place. And so what you have, what the Federal Reserve did with zero interest rates and quantitative easing, was they've distorted the credit markets. They've distorted in this way. Lending to government, new credit to the government, new credit to the government in the last five years, overall government in this country has gone up 37 percent. The increase in credit to large companies has gone up, to th has gone up 32 percent. Lending to small businesses and households up 6 percent. Pitiful, pitiful figure for a supposed recovery. And so in terms of sounds zero, zero interest rate sounds great, but it reminds you of the saying of the old Soviet Union where they said the health care was free, the health care is free, but you can't get any. And that's, and, that's, and that's what's unfolded today. So perversely, the more the Federal Reserve suppresses interest rates, the longer it does it, the longer you're not going to have a healthy functioning credit market. So like what the Fed does is like saying let's deal with obesity by changing scales. You know, if you increase the number of ounces in a pound from 16 to 32, lose half your weight, boy, that's, that sounds pretty good. But in, terms, but in term, terms of the real world, it does not work. It does not work. And so this instability is very hurtful and has political consequences. You don't get growth. When you don't get growth and income stagnate, there are political repercussions. We see that in Europe. We see that in other parts of the world. We're seeing it here. Scapegoating increases, whether it's immigrants, the rich, the bankers, or the idlers living off the government, or even police. People looking for a reason. What, what is going on? And it's not just about GDP, median incomes, and the like. Unstable money also undermines what you might call social trust. Money is based on trust, as I said earlier. Pieces of paper, blips on a computer. You assume that claim works. But if it starts to shift in value and you don't understand why, then it corrodes trust with other things. Money is what holds a society together, interacting with each other. And so what happens? John Maynard Keynes, occasionally he got something right. Back in 1919, he said, Keynes said, Lenin was certainly right. There is no subtler, no sure means of overturning the existing basis of, of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does so in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Ponder that. People suddenly see values, values getting uh, distorted. Things, values don't work anymore. And so the irony is Keynes was talking about a hyperinflation, the kind that hit Russia, the kind that would hit Germany, would set the stage for Hitler. But he didn't realize, because he didn't realize that you can have a slow motion debasement of the currency or a slow motion undermining of faith in the currency and still get the same result, even though it takes, uh, goes over a period of time. And so think of it, you know, John Locke worried about warned about when you have unstable money, what it does between creditor and lender. Both end up not getting what they contracted for. You see it with, with the, the subprime mortgage boom and then bust, or mortgages. Lenders, banks ended up taking a hit. Borrowers ended up taking a hit. Research shows that when you have weak money, crime goes up. Research shows that in countries with stable money, you have more trust with people, you have long-term higher rates of growth when countries or currencies are chronically unstable. Not to be politically offensive, but I'm not running for anything. You take a country like Brazil, which is always debasing its currency. They have periods of stability, but then they go back into their bad habits. And so, what, so it's no, no real mystery as to why their police are not trusted 
why they have a lot, why the police are always looked at as engaging in uh, quiet murders on the side. No social trust. And you hear it, you hear, as I mentioned, you see it here at home. Weak money, unstable money, unstable money inflames perceptions of unfairness. That's why there's all this talk of cronyism. People getting ahead, not through doing honest business, for having a product or service that people like, but through who you know, who gives you the favors. That's why people feel that maybe the next generation isn't going to do as well as this generation. So you have more social divisions. Politicians see an opening. The 1% versus the 99%. The 47% versus everyone else. Young versus old, public sector versus the private sector. Unstable money mocks values, mocks honest effort, the link between honest effort and reward. It mocks prudence. Remember a thing called interest, which I referred to earlier, once upon a time, if you made a deposit, saved money, lent money, you got something in return for it. So prudence is mocked. It fuels extremes. So what do we do about it? Short term, the Fed should just realize that it can't manage an economy. The Soviet Union shows that mandarins cannot manage economies. The Fed can't do it either. Amazingly, because monetary policy is so boring, so intimidating, it doesn't get much examination politically that it should. And so the Fed has become an immensely powerful institution, allocating credit, distorting markets. I mentioned earlier about the growth of credit to big companies versus small businesses. Take, uh, when you have cheap money, those who can't get it can't get it. But those who can get it, gorge on it. Take Apple. I love Apple. Apple computer. But Apple today now has over $200 billion of cash. Yet in the recent years, Apple has borrowed $40 billion in bonds, issued $40 billion of bonds. Why, when you have so much cash, would you borrow money like that? The answer is because it could. It could do it for tax purposes. It could do it for financial engineering. Not so long ago, it issued a bunch of 10-year bonds where the yield, thanks to the Fed, was less than the yield on Apple's dividend. So why wouldn't you borrow the money? buy in the stock. You look at the recent increase in profits. A lot of it was what is financial engineering. Great for the stockholders. I love it. But not a very efficient and productive use of capital. But that's what happens. So what should the Fed do short term? Start, start letting this bloated quantitative easing created portfolio run down. When a bond becomes due, don't reinvest it. Let the cash go back into the economy, into the banking system. That would be huge. Another thing they should do is let interest rates start to seek their natural level. The amazing thing is credit would, not, credit would be more plentiful and credit would flow in a more efficient, productive manner than it is today. It could go to smaller and new businesses again. Cease this hyper-regulation where bureaucrats substitute their judgment for those of bankers. If a banker messes up, bankers mess up, let them suffer the consequences for it. But don't have a bureaucrat thinking they can do better. For those of you who want to get in this or want to impress people at a cocktail party, talk about the evils of Basel III. Tell them first this is not cooking. Basel, Basel refers to banking regulators around the world, they come together in Basel, Switzerland, to try to come up with international regulations. Because after all, we live in a global economy. Sounds benign. But one of the silly things they started to do years ago was try to assign risk, try to assign a level of risk to different levels of assets. For example, they determined that the most riskless asset you could have as a bank, government bonds. So therefore, you didn't need hardly any reserves for government bonds. The next, next less risky thing was mortgages. Heard that word before? And the riskiest thing they determined was loans to businesses. So for example,
before Greece's problems became public, the regulators under Basel determined that a loan to the Greek government was less risky than a loan to IBM or Apple. That's Basel. Crazy. So stop the hyper-regulation. Throw Basel out and put it back in the kitchen or send it to Switzerland. But don't, don't have it be regulating. And then there are a few other more technical things that can be done. But ultimately, and this will sound very strange, so I'm counting on your politeness. Ultimately, we have to go to where we were for 180 years. It wasn't perfect, but link the dollar to gold. You say, oh my God, this guy, is he a survivalist? You know, is he, is he up in the hills with his canned goods, you know, waiting, waiting for the end? Barbed wire around the house? No, no. There's so much myth about gold, I'm not going to get into tonight. But think of gold as you would a yardstick, a yardstick of value or a scale that measures weight. Why would you link a currency to gold? Because it works. It's like Polaris. Gold keeps for a variety of reasons, which I'll touch on. Gold keeps its value better than any other thing on Earth. Better than silver, better than copper, better than bottles of water, oil, whatever. And there are, there are several fold reasons for it. One is it's rare, but not too rare. You can't destroy it. You know, you can beat it, smash it, heat it, freeze it, but you can't destroy it. Every ounce that's been mined still exists. Experts estimate we've mined about six billion ounces. We counted for about five and a half billion, so it's been pointed out. If you have a gold ring, there may be particles in there that go back to Egyptian pharaoh times. You get no supply shocks. After all, you don't consume gold. It's very, most of it's not used. And so it's not like wheat, where you get a drought, that'll affect, the, that'll affect the price. It's not consumed right away. It's strong, but it's malleable. It's compact. It's not like uh, having to haul oil around. Very compact. You know, easy to store. You don't have to worry about termites or mice eating the gold. Very easy to store. So it has that, uh, so it keeps its intrinsic value. When you see the price of gold fluctuate, that's not the intrinsic value of gold fluctuating as much as it is market perceptions about the value of the currency now and fears or hopes for the future. So gold fixed fluctuation in the dollar price, the market's perceptions about the dollar. So it's like a yardstick. It doesn't restrict money supply. It just makes sure like a, uh, your cruise control on a car, you're going at a certain speed. So throw out one other statistic. From 1775 to 1900, when we went from a small East Coast, barely agricultural nation, mostly subsistence farming, to 1900, when our population had grown almost 25-fold, greatest industrial nation in the world, the dollar was fixed to gold, except during the Civil War and the aftermath, but it was, everyone understood it was be linked to gold. During that period of time, the amount of gold mined in the world went up about three and a half fold. The money supply in the U.S. during that period went up 160 fold. So again, just as a ruler, 12 inches and a foot doesn't restrict the size of a building you may wish to construct, so too, having a currency with a fixed value doesn't restrict the size of the economy. If you have the right policies, the right environment, the right culture, you have a big money supply. That's why the British money supply was so big in the, in the 1800s. People just in Britain didn't want it. They wanted it, but so did everyone else around the world. because It was seen as the perfect currency. So proportionately, per capita, pounds per capita in Britain were high. Monetarists looking at that might say, oh my God, there's too much money creation. No, it was demand. People wanted it. Use it, just as they used to use the dollar. So how would a thing, how would a gold standard work? Very simple. Let's just strip away all the gobbledygook. Let's say we fix it $1,100 an ounce. All that means is if it goes above $1,100, you tighten up. If it goes below $1,100, you ease up. That's simple. That's simple. 
And so in terms of what the Fed has done today, it's created an artificial shortage of dollars because of the hyper-regulation and what it's done, people not knowing what the real price of money is, so it's hurting the economy. Before that, it created weakened the dollar with the connivance of our Treasury Department. We saw the chaos that came out of that. So you want a fixed value, just as you want a fixed number of minutes in an hour. It's basic, but they don't yet get it. Fortunately, fortunately, things are beginning to change. You saw one little, intellectually, these things are very slow, but people are starting to look at a gold standard, and I say a gold standard because there are numerous variations of it. There's not one gold standard, just as like there's not one kind of democracy. Our rules are different from Canada's. Canada's electoral rules are different from Britain's. Britain's different from Germany. France. Each has their own permutation differences. But essence on the gold standard is it's fixed to uh, a fixed value. And the, you can uh, have the old classical gold standard, but you don't even, in a modern one, you don't even know you need to own an ounce of gold. Just look at the price each day. High school students could run the s system. Hillsdale graduates would be dominating the system. But it would, bring an end, it would bring an end to the chaos we see in the world today. You've got to get the money right. And the good news is that intellectual ferment is just beginning. There's a bill before Congress from the man who's going to be heading up the Ways and Means Committee, now that Paul Ryan's going to become Speaker, a fellow named Kevin Brady, a congressman from Texas. He wants a commission of people sanctioned by Congress to examine where we go in terms of monetary policy. That's the way you get the debate and discussion going. A little over a year ago, Paul Volcker made the observation that since we blew up the Bretton Woods monetary system, which was gold-based after World War II, and by the way, in the 50s and 60s, under that system, the U.S. growth rates are about 50 percent higher than we've had since we went off a gold standard. But Volcker said that since we blew up the Bretton Woods system, we've had more chaos around the world, more currency crisis. And research has shown that. Bank of England did some research a couple of years ago. So he didn't endorse a gold standard, but he recognized, as others are beginning to recognize, that what we're doing is not working. And so the way you get changed is you begin to ask the question, it's not working, where do we go from here? What do we do next? Another little harbinger was on that debate, CNBC debate. There was a good question that was asked. It happened that night when, when Rick Santelli got to ha ask his little question. He asked it of Cruz and then of Rand Paul. He said, what about the Federal Reserve? What do you think should be done about it? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? And Cruz in his answer, Senator Cruz in his answer, talked about auditing the Fed and all that stuff. Fed's got to stop manipulating markets. And then he said, ideally, he said, the dollar should be linked to gold. Now, no one, of course, followed up on it, but that's the beginning. Cruz is interested in it. I've talked to him after that debate. So it's beginning to happen. Not overnight, but that's how things begin to happen. They get a discussion. And you combine that with what's happening on taxes. Look what's happening on taxes. On the Republican side, almost every candidate has put out a plan for tax simplification. Now, only three of them, four of them, have a flat tax. That's four more than there was four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago. I ran 16 years ago, so there's one flat taxer. But this time, there are four of them. Now, the, the, their variations and how they're doing it, Dr. Ben Carson, former Senator Santorum, Rand Paul has one, Ted Cruz has one, but they're out there discussing it. The others have uh, their simplification, they have more than one rate, but with one exception, the highest rate is 28 percent. Some, some of them have as low as 25 or 23 percent. Now, the one exception, we've got to educate him, is Senator Rubio. He has his high rate is, he has two rates, 15 percent and 35 percent. Uh, that's almost like 39.6. 
and his 35% rate hits incomes far lower than they do in the current tax code, he makes up for it, he says, with having a big kitty credit. The French tried that. It doesn't work in terms of if you want to goose up families. That's, that's a whole other matter. But other than that, they're all in the 20s. Now you say, so, that, so big things are going to happen. Already among Democrats and Republicans, there's now a consensus that on the corporate side, we've got to change things. The only outlier is the White House, which to them, tax reform means higher taxes. Their version of a flat tax is 100 percent. What did you make? Send it in. You know, two, two, two line flat tax. But among most Democrats, there's a realization. I think after this election, since so many Republicans are in favor of simplification, you're going to get a mandate for tax reform on the personal and corporate side. And that'll be huge. Because if we do it, other nations will do it. When Reagan put on those sweeping tax cuts in the early 80s, Within a few years, 50 nations around the world followed suit. If we get it right, the rest of the world has a chance to get it right. We have to lead the way. Other countries can do it, but this country, they will follow if they see that it is working. So it is critical. Now you say, well, aren't two or three rates, if they're in the 20s, teens, high rate of 25 percent, that's pretty good, right? Sure it is. Let's go for the pure, because this is what happened. Some of you may remember back in 1986. In 1986, there was tax reform. They got rid of tax shelters, had two tax rates, 15 percent and 28 percent. Remember, under Reagan, when he took office, the highest rate was 70. And they got it down to 28, but they left two rates in there. Ladies and gentlemen, putting two tax rates together is like putting two rabbits together. They multiply. Within a, few, within a few years of 86, it went up to three, then four, now it's seven. And when you include clawbacks, it's almost infinite number of marginal tax rates that are out there in this complicated code. But the good news is politicos are starting to move in the right direction. The good news is on money. It's just beginning, people realizing. And even though it will take a few years before we get to what we did for 180 years, modernize it. There are a lot of things we can do to make sure the Fed undoes the damage. And the other big thing on health care, I'm not going to get in tonight, we just don't have the time. The big thing on health care that is starting to take place in this crazy environment, we just got to get through the next couple of years, is for the first time we're getting more consumer, consumerism in health care. We're going to get a real free market in health care. Just ask yourself, step back for a moment, and ask yourself, why do we have a health care crisis? And everyone says, well, because people like me are getting older, we want more of it, so prices keep going up. Demand for health care is seen as a disaster, but why? Demand for anything else is considered a great opportunity. People want more cars and trucks. Manufacturers in Detroit and elsewhere are glad to help you out. People want more apps. A lot of writers are glad to help you out, but yet, in health care, it's seen as a disaster that people want more of it. It's because we, we have this disconnect between providers and consumers, and the proof of it is, finally hit me a few years ago, if you go to a clinic or hospital and you ask in advance what the treatment costs, you get a very strange look. It means one of two things. Either you're uninsured or you're crazy. I mean, why would you want to know the price? What's it to you? Can you imagine? Going out and buying a nice meal, saying, I don't care what it costs, let Medicare, Blue Shield, or Aetna worry about it. System goes crazy. That's going to change. You see little signs of it. Then we'll close. Little signs of it. Flu shots. Talk about delivery of health care. Once upon a time, you wanted a flu shot. Make an appointment. Go to the doc, clinic, or hospital. Big deal. Now you get it anywhere. Go to the drugstore. Go to the airport. Go to the gas station, say, fill her up, give me a flu shot, do the windshield, and be, be, be on your way. You start to see more and more in walk-in clinics, CVS, Walgreens, and others. You go in, nurse practitioner, research shows 80% of our maladies can be treated by technicians or nurse practitioners and the like. 20%, we need the full-fledged doc. So it's beginning to change, and big things are coming in terms of cures, immunotherapies and cancer and the like. 
big positive things coming, but they won't come if we don't have real free markets. And finally, we're patients and doctors can make decisions and not third party bureaucrats. That has got to happen and it will happen. So the key thing on health care, just don't get sick for the next three years till we, sort this, till we sort this thing out. But the amazing thing is, by trying to socialize health care, Obama has set in forces uh, doing a lot of destruction in its wake, but set in forces that's going to get turn health care from a seemingly hopeless liability into the most dynamic growth industry ever. Why? Because health care is the most personal thing out there, more than taxes or anything else. Health care hits us, hits our friends, families, in a way that nothing else does. So bottom line on the money, and I focused on it tonight because I was asked by Larry, but it is one area that hasn't received the attention that health care is getting, that taxes are getting, but it needs to be done because we've got to get that right. Fix weights and measures. It works everywhere, including money. Thank you. So you know uh, we have uh, some uh, helpers here, uh, students with uh, microphones, raise your hand and they will uh, bring the microphone to you, uh, the handhelds to you and uh, we'll be on our way. Following the conclusion of the session, Mr. Forbes has agreed to sign copies of his book, Money, How the Destruction of the Dollar Threatens and What We Can Do About It, on the other side of this curtain. As Mr. Forbes said, we ha now have time for a few questions. Steve, thank you very much for your global economy and what we can do about it on the other side of this curtain. As Mr. Forbes said, we ha now have time for a few questions. Steve, thank you for the lecture tonight. One quick question. Uh, I've been looking at this 50 years in my lifetime. It seems to me it comes down to people and virtual people, people with virtue. And money is a virtuous thing if it's handled correctly and a very evil thing if it's not done correctly. And as us private individuals out here looking at this mess, what can we do to help progress this process to get to virtual people? Uh, first, by your being here and showing a keen interest in uh, what, what is happening and where we've gone wrong, uh, that, that, that's, that's a critical step. The other is to share it. I mean, in Primus, I mean, share, start sharing this. There are a lot of good think tanks out there that do uh, good research on this. And uh, in terms of areas where you may not have an expertise, I mean, there's no way one human being can be an expert on everything, unless you're in politics, and we see where that leads. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, the, but the key thing is then either learn about it or ask your uh, representatives, we got a mess at the Fed, what are you doing about it? For example, the next time Janet Yellen goes before Congress, and she's done this before, she always says we want 2% inflation, which when you think about it is kind of nuts. Why, why do you want unstable money? But they believe that inflation causes prosperity. So she wants 2% inflation. Why not have a representative ask her? That means for a typical family making $50,000 a year, their prices would go up $1,000, 2% of $50,000. Why do $1,000 of higher expenses stimulate the economy for a middle class family? Who gave you the authority to put that tax increase in? And take, take it from there. And believe me, if, you, if, if, if representatives start to believe there's some interest in this, they will start to learn about it just for thing called sheer survival. So, yeah, take it from here. <laughs> so, I liked your talk, but I really didn't understand the joke at the beginning about Harvard University. <laughs> yeah. some, you know, you know some of old... my best friends are at Harvard. I know, so, so, so are some of mine. Uh, shows great tolerance that, uh, <laughs> and uh, you, 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 you know the old joke, uh, you can always tell a Harvard man because he will tell you. And, uh, 
<laughs> it's true, I, even today now, the co-ed, a lot of the graduates, you talk within 10 minutes, it'll slip out that they went to Harvard. That's just, I don't know what, what that is, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I want to understand better your view on monetary policy since the end of the <clears throat> financial crisis, say since 2009. <clears throat> if you look at the monetary part, there's been this explosion of the Fed's balance sheet and various monetary aggregates, and it's looked very unstable. But if you look at inflation, it's actually been extremely low, and it's been quite stable, particularly compared with other periods. So if you look at the monetary side, you say it was monetary instability. If you look at inflation side, you'd say it was almost price stability. So I wonder how you look at that uh, contrast. Um, well, well, first of all, in terms of uh, uh, put aside how you measure the cost of living, put, put that question aside. There's a whole debate on how you should compute the CPI, whether you can really compute an accurate one. Put that aside. But in terms of since 2009, uh, what, what, what the Fed has done is by, they've, they've exploded their balance sheet, which the 70s should have, would have told us since the proportionally they've done twice as much what they call creation of monetary reserves, bank reserves. Uh, the uh, monetary thing called uh, M0. Um, twice the rate they did in the 70s, so why isn't everything going up 20% a year? The reason is with those, with those uh, reserves, with the money that they, in effect, created, what they did was, first they bought long-term bonds, sold their short-term, bought long-term bonds to suppress interest rates, but they also put in a regular, and they also gave you interest on those reserves. And they also put in a regular, harsh regulatory regime after Dodd-Frank. So in effect, the money was not lent out into the economy. The banks found it far easier just to let it sit at the Fed, earn your 25 basis points, which was higher than you'd get on your short-term treasuries. And since you didn't know what the real price of money was and you had looked at the mortgage market where, yes, those teaser rates were great, but when they went, when they went up, what it looked like a solvent borrower suddenly became a very insolvent borrower. Are you going to uh, risk regulatory ire lending to an entity where you don't know what the real price of what you're lending is? You're going to, the regulators are going to want this papered six ways to Sunday. It's just much easier to let it sit at the Fed. So what the Fed has done, in effect, is expropriated almost $3 trillion of cash. You look at the bank balance sheets, almost 17, 18 percent of their assets are now parked at the Federal Reserve. So the money didn't go in the economy. It's like filling up the reservoir and then blocking the pipes. So it never made its way into the economy. And what it did do, is that uh, by gumming up the credit markets, so you weren't going to take a risk, it went to the apples, it went to the federal government, and uh, more than it did to, uh, like in a normal credit market, where all sorts of borrowers would have access. You'd pay a price, but you could get the credit. There's a little piece, some of you have heard of Steve Moore, the economist. He wrote a piece uh, a couple of few weeks ago. He was denied a mortgage because he, he was not getting a government-guaranteed mortgage. Even though he had a nice income, his bride-to-be had a nice income, they'd put down 25, 30 percent down payment. No bank, several of the big banks turned them down for a mortgage. Why? Because several years ago, he was late on a couple of credit card payments. And that's a red flag to the regulators if the mortgage is not government-guaranteed. So here's a guy, perfectly good income, pays his bills, perfectly good FICO score, 25% down, where Wells Fargo and others would not lend, make the mortgage. So you're right, the monetary base exploded, but they did something different, and a lot of people have missed this. And I ask the fundamental question, why, when you had this huge explosion in the monetary base, why didn't you get what happened in the 70s? Because what happened this time through regulation, through paying on reserves and other things, the money never was lent out into the economy. You didn't have the leverage. You know, when you go to school, they say one dollar of high-powered money creates eight to ten dollars of loans. You know, they walk you through the thing. Didn't happen this time. And that's the big difference. 
And so that's why we've had this subpar recovery is the credit markets didn't work, plus you add on to that the, stu the silliness, being polite, of Obamacare and uh, regulatory binging, where the government's involved and gets more involved in everything. You've got this consumer protection agency inside the Fed waging war jihad against auto dealers. And uh, uh, by the way, you thought NSA was not looking at your specific phone calls, but looking for patterns and the hoo-ha that caused. This new consumer protection agency ensconced inside the Fed that gets all of its money from the Fed, not through congressional appropriation. They're looking, they're looking at patterns on your credit cards. See if something's going wrong. It's a fishing expedition. There's a piece in the journal on it a couple, few months ago. So uh, it's a different environment. And part of our problem is it's human nature. We always fight the last war. It's not just generals or admirals who do it. We do it all the time. Business, you do it all the time. We, we, we say we've experienced this thing, so we figured it's going to repeat itself. But what happened with the Fed this time had a very different end result than what happened in the 70s. And the other thing is, in the early part of the decade, you saw some increase in the consumer price index, but this was uh, mainly went into assets, commodities, and houses. A little bit on land. I remember speaking in Nebraska a couple of years ago and uh, warning them because land prices were moving up. I said, you know, we went through this in the 70s. They said, oh yes, this time we're well aware of it. We're not leveraging. These were farmers not leveraging the way we did in the 70s. And they said the ones who are really binging on it are not farmers, but uh, investors, outside investors, funds and the like. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. But it was very different. But the thing to keep in mind is very different. What they've done is for the moment killed the traditional way we thought credit was created in the economy. High powered money, leveraged eight to 10 to one, not, not working today for a variety of reasons. That's the key thing. We have time for one more question. When Carter became president, inflation shot up to 18%. I thought we had joined the ranks of the banana republics. Then Reagan became president, and I thought, finally, we have turned the corner. We are no longer on the road to serfdom. Now, 20, 30 years later, we are still firmly on the road to serfdom. So even if we get a Reagan again, will it make any difference? Because afterwards, we will still go back to walking down the road to serve them? A uh, question about uh, how, how, after Reagan, could we be in the mess that we're in today? And part of the answer is we did not have then the, what you might call the base of intellectual understanding and ideas and advocates that we had that, that uh, today, that we have today that we did not have 35 years ago. And in terms, even among Republicans 35 years ago, there's sort of the feeling the government should play a real big role. And uh, yeah, we shouldn't have inflation, we should cut tax rates, but they didn't take it to the, next, to the next step. And I think now, morally, people are beginning to realize that if you believe in free markets, you just can't say they work. You also have to make the moral case for free markets. And that's, the, that's a still a big task in front of us, that's why I wrote couple of books on it. Others are doing it. Numerous have done it for a number of years. But in essence, you succeed in free markets by meeting the needs and wants of other people. You can't, even if you lust for money, you don't get it unless you provide something that somebody else wants. Now, sometimes, as Steve Jobs said when he was asked, Steve Jobs was asked once, do you do marketing surveys? And he famously replied, no, because people don't know what they want until we show them. That's all, all part of entrepreneurship. You provide something new, you don't know if it's gonna work. People suddenly, uh, they may discover they couldn't have lived without it. But meeting the needs and wants of other people, and just keep in mind, philanthropy and commerce are often portrayed as polar opposites. You succeed in commerce, you make up for your sins by giving it away to philanthropy. They're not polar opposites. They're two sides of the same coin meeting the needs and wants of other people. 
different ways to do it, but same objective, which is why the U.S., the most commercial nation ever invented, is also the most philanthropic nation in the world. Two sides of the same coin. We have to make that moral case. And there's a lot more understanding about economics, a lot more understanding about free markets today than there was 35 years ago, 60 years ago, 80 years ago. Now we know more and more that when you get these big economic crises, it's not a sudden failure of free market, an outbreak of greed. It is massive government policy error. Now, I just want to say it doesn't excuse wrongdoing in free markets or wrongdoing by bankers or anybody else. But human nature hasn't changed in thousands of years. People's ability to do bad things preceded Adam Smith. Believe me, uh, just look at the Bible. You can see this is something that predated Adam Smith. So uh, it's a very good question. But now I think we are setting the foundation where we get a good president, good. But what we want is understanding, as Hillsdale's tried to do, where even if you get a total mediocrity, the accepted wisdom is the Constitution, free markets, having a moral basis of a free society. Those things should, and when that happens, you don't have to depend on a Reagan when you have that kind of consensus. So we got to get the consensus right and not be dependent on particular outstanding individuals. Thank you very much.